Hi, everyone. Thanks for participating. I really enjoyed that. It was my first time doing a live stream event. And um, but I didn't really get to any of the questions. I didn't know how it would go. So I just thought I would go through some of them here and do my very best to respond. And um, so I'm just going to go through here and then find some of the others that I found. And uh, so I'm going to start with Gabriel Gonzalez. Uh, since moving to a strictly compounding ideas portfolio, do you find one-off mispriced opportunities like the ones Buffett mentions he could earn 50% on with very little risk? Any examples that have already worked out or should? Uh, so I, I think that the last four or five years, and this is just me talking for myself, have been very hard to find those kinds of things. I think everything's been mispriced slash overpriced. At the same time, I think that if somebody was more capable than I was or able, as I discussed in the talk, to string the facts, same facts together in a different way and see something different, maybe I would have found something. But I think that going now into the next few years, we're probably going to see more of those. And it'll be interesting to see if, um, if I manage to uncover some or maybe Monish does. Um, it's also worth saying that we had a combination of low interest rates, market exuberance, but also a lot of very smart analysts who um, scour the world. And so maybe maybe those kinds of opportunities no longer around. I'm not sure, but I hope that kind of goes some way to giving a sense, Gabriel, of uh, what I'm thinking. Uh, and another question from Gabriel. Uh, uh, fun size, no, not at this point. I don't think, I mean, uh, when the fund was far smaller, I invested $1 million in a market a company with a $7 million market cap. And uh, it went up four or five times and it would have been nice to have been able to put more money into that. So that was a limitation. But in general, I've found that it's, that I've wanted to invest in larger cap companies, but uh, so I don't think it's a limiting factor today. Uh, because I'm not focused on these ultra small cap situations. So um, I think that my perception is that at a billion, maybe I've, I'm at 300 million, maybe at a billion or 2 billion, that would start to become an issue. Uh, and Sneer says, asks, hi, Sneer. Prabhra is known to pick stocks. Did he ever pick, but did he ever pick an industry? Seeing big headwinds for a specific industry, but instead picking a stock using some other tool some, to bet on the industry as a whole? It's a great question. Uh, I, you know, I've, in a certain sense, focused a little bit on branded goods on the one hand and on credit rating agencies on another. Um, but I'm not, you know, that's a question to ask Monish, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, what was I doing seeing Alibaba at uh, $60? Uh, not much, just, you know, Things would go up and go down, things move around, and every now and then one acts. Uh, uh, but thanks for the question, Tao. Rob, I have no thoughts on Ryman Healthcare. Uh, and then Manish asks, has Monish thought of changing his idea of big bets on high uncertainty names to fairly certain names, as a few of his big bets turned out to be not such a good investment? How does he handle client expectations when performance ain't up to the mark? Uh, well, I guess I can't answer that really. Um, uh, that's for Monish to answer. Um, but uh, you know, uh, I think that Monish said on the on the on the live stream that you can fully expect even half of your um, conclusions to be wrong. So half of your ideas don't work out, but as long as you hold on to your winners, you're going to do extraordinarily well. Uh, and uh, so you have to expect a high error rate as you do this, higher than you ever expected it to be, and still uh, continue to do it and not get discouraged and understand that even the world's greatest investors had a high or have a high error rate. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you ask so Tao, you ask this question about China. And we, it's interesting, we just saw demonstrations across the country, something quite unusual. And just as we thought that Xi Jinping was fully confirmed 
uh, it, it's kind of a challenge to his authority. And I do not believe that China is going to go backwards from here and it's going to find a way to move forwards. And exactly how it does that is not clear to me. Uh, uh, but I, I believe that uh, policy making in China will continue to be more than less rational. And one can certainly make the claim that the way they've handled COVID and lockdowns is less rational than other countries. But at the same time, I pay close attention to the UK and I see that a full liberal open democracy can um, uh, make a very bad decision around the European Union and Brexit, for example. And so even smaller open democracies can go in the wrong direction for a while and eventually they adjust to reality. And I believe that China will do the same thing. And uh, Chinese people have tasted prosperity or tasted increases in prosperity. They're not about to give that up. Uh, there's a very palpable sense that uh, prosperity is not just a Western thing, it's a global thing. And so they've got to find a way that's consistent with Chinese history and Chinese culture. And uh, I feel very confident that that will happen. Uh, I think that that was all the questions here. So now I can go to uh, YouTube, I believe, and go to my channel. Uh, well, there it is there. And we can just, uh, that was the actual event itself. But um, forgive me all, my goal is just to uh, honor the fact that people ask questions and I set an expectation that we would ask questions. So top chat replay, I guess that's what I'm going to do. Brad Kellner. <clears throat> so some of this is just commentary. The craziest thing each of us did or do for due diligence, Michael Dizon. I think that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, it's it, it might, Miko, I guess. It, it's such a good question. <laughs> I wish I'd... Because, I mean, uh, traveling to meet people. Uh, I used to uh, go into every Weetabix store around and talk to people about their Weetabix consumption. I'd go to housewives' cupboards when I was in their homes and open them and see what products they'd bought and then talk to them about what products they'd bought. Uh, and, and I think that a change that I have between uh, when I wrote my book and now is that I think that those kind of like very granular impressions, while they're not representative reality, you may get a, the wrong sample of reality. Uh, so you have to factor that in. You have to factor in that you might have the wrong sample or a sample that is not representative of the reality that's out there. But getting really granular, whether it's talking to a supplier or a customer, uh, in any way, shape, or form is something that I think is valuable to do. And the question is great because it it is asking for uh, unusual ways to do due diligence. And it's saying, well, what ways did you think up? And I just really like the question. So thank you for putting it. Um, a huge regret that I have is during the time that we owned Horsehead, that I owned Horsehead, I never visited the plant. Now the company discouraged me from visiting for now what I know are good reasons but I should have just traveled to where the plant was. This was a company that ended up fighting for chapter 11. I suffered significant losses and uh, they were building a new plant and they'd taken on debt to do it. And I was curious to see the new plant and they said, not ready, not ready. And I should have just gone there and hung out in a local Starbucks. I'm sure I would have gotten scuttlebutt if you like. So um, David Ono writes, what did he learn most from his mother? Um, Monish's mother was, was a lovely lady and I very much enjoyed meeting her a uh, very special person who for a while lived in Hounslow which is where my father has an office uh, uh, but you know not for me to really answer just that she really was a lovely lady uh, David Park 10% position feels like the water is at my neck Monish holding my beer going for a cannon ball <laughs> In which case, do 5% positions, which is what uh, I think is better for me. Uh, Julius, he, uh, Fawaz asked, hi, Brad, by the way. Fawaz asked a question of Julius. 
how is the investment competition on Suntec Realty going versus MasterCard in between you and Guy Spear going? Um, I don't know how it's going. <laughs> but the thing is, it, what that misses is that if I own Suntec Realty, I might get a lot less sleep. And I'm sleeping very well with the MasterCard, and that's also important. So Alexandru marries Dragut, Guy and Monish. Considering the initiation phase of a young investor, what would be the mental model required to move on more easily from bad decision taken previously? Um, it's a great question. And uh, because I try to instill in all the people around me that the key driver of success is not whether or not you make mistakes, it's how you recover from the mistakes and how long of a time you let you take to get your ego and your self-esteem back in action so you can go out there and take on something else. And um, I don't think there is any easy answers for that. Not for me. I think that is a very, very tough thing when you suffer a setback. Of course, one is discouraged. And part of it, you know, in position sizing is sizing the positions in such a way that the setback doesn't devastate you. And Monish has far greater experience or far greater capacity to to take significant setbacks and i have lesser capacity which means that i need to size my bets smaller uh, and that will ultimately affect it, it reduces my probability for outsized success uh, if i was capable of having larger position sizes and having um, larger losses when they come along i would also have much greater gains when they came along but i also have to understand myself. And so I think that I'm doing it in a way that's consistent with my personality because there's playing in the game, there's playing the game to win, and then there's playing the game to stay in the game. And if I play the game in such a way that theoretically I could win big, but it kicks me out of the game, then I've lost. And so investing is a kind of an infinite game. I refer you to the book James by James Castle by Simon Sinek, both have books on playing infinite games. So you have to know yourself and know what is it what is it that would put me out of the game and not do any more than that, do anything that would. And so many things can put you out of the game, including becoming very, very discouraged because you've just lost a heap of money more than you bargained for. So that means that 99% of your net worth is in T-bills and you only gamble with 1% gamble or put at risk 1%, then you know, know yourself and if in doubt, are on the safe side of uh, the dividing line, not on the dangerous side. But thank you for a very good question. Um, insightful IR, talking to clients can be miserable if and when it happens. And individual investors, I just say, do have significant advantages. Um, you're not worried about when the money's going to be pulled from you. And there are so many situations where you know what's going to happen. You just don't know when. And uh, But if the money's pulled for you from you before it happens, that is an added stress that you don't need. So there are significant advantages that individual investors have over professional managers. Um, scanning down... Investors are running away from China. Does China war is China worth attention right now? You know, yes, I believe so. <laughs> I believe so. Um, moving swiftly or scanning down. Uh, two books that I've liked in the recent past when I'm looking across uh, the two novels that I've got on my my. Um, my uh, reading shelf as I'm I'm reading still uh, Le Rouge et Le Noir by um, Stendhal. And then I'm going to read uh, Buddenbrooks by Thomas Mann. And uh, the books that I've got, I've got a book on authenticity by Alice Sherwood. And I've got a book called Killer in the Kremlin by John Sweeney. I've got another book on uh, Ukraine the Long Night in Ukraine, I believe it's called. That's what I'm up to right now on my reading. Um, yeah, just scanning down. Uh, 
uh, some of these are comments. Yeah, Rutvik, um, the the intuition is not to commit consistent consistency bias. So when you say something's true, you're more likely to believe it, even if it isn't true. So you need to be very careful about making uh, talking in public about things that we may not be sure are true. And my experience is that there's a difference between talking to one person, 10 people, 500 people, or, a, or, a, or an audience that could include millions. Uh, simply look up consistent commitment, consistency bias in um, Cialdini's uh, standard. Well, Charlie Munger's got this standard causes, 24 standard causes of human misjudgment. And uh, Roberto Cialdini has got a book, The Psychology of Human Misjudgment. It's in both of those. Um, yeah, I have no views on meta. Yeah, bad decision. I, 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 I went to that. Uh, Brookfield Asset Management, I really don't know enough about it. Um, Yeah, uh, I think that's it. And uh, thank you so much. I hope that's helpful. I enjoyed doing it. I'm going to look into doing live streams myself. Uh, that was an initiation for me. Uh, thank you all. I hope this is helpful. Give me some feedback and tell me if you enjoyed this, if it was worth doing the extra answers to questions like this. Thanks. Bye.